Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For you who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pensions. Today's guest is Larry Kotlikov, and he's an economist from the US, and he has worked in many different areas, and generational accounting is one of the things he's done a lot with. He also has written 20-odd books. One is, the latest one is called Money Magic, and that's helping people figuring out the way how to get most out of the savings in the quite complicated American system. He's also have an advice tool or an advisor. It's called MaxiFin. And with that, he helped people sort of plan the future and understand what different decisions will have on the, if they move, for example, to another state or sell their house and, and make it easier for them. And he also has a very interesting blog called Economics Matters. So if you haven't signed up to that already, please do that. And with that, Larry, I wish you welcome to Pioneering Pensions. Great to be with you, Stefan. Pleasure. It's going to be fun. Uh, before we start, by the way, everybody who are in the audience, remember, we're doing this to help you also get to the answer to your questions. For the first half an hour, Larry and I will have a conversation. And after that, we open up to your questions. So don't hesitate writing down your questions. Don't be shy because we want to have a good conversation here and you are an important part of that. So Larry, my first question to you, it has a bit of a long runway because a couple of weeks ago, a documentary by Theo Kocken, the founder of Cardano, had a premiere in the Netherlands. And in there, you are one of the opening lines and you have a perfect one liner in there saying about retirement, the risk is not dying. The risk is to live to 100. Can you elaborate on that and, and tell us what you meant by that? Well, I'm, I'm delighted uh, Theo has um, put out another uh, film. Uh, he's a good, a good buddy from long, long standing and uh, doing great things for uh, the country and, and also obviously Cardano in the past. Uh, but, you know, when we are uh, 60 or so, uh, we're sitting here thinking, gee, our life expectancy is 15 years. Uh, we should plan on that horizon. That's what the financial industry is telling us, uh, at least in the U.S., because for Americans, uh, they have their money in retirement accounts and Social Security, their retirement income is coming from these two sources. And Wall Street would like people to take their Social Security money first and the retirement money second so they can leave their retirement money with the Wall Street brokers who can then charge fees. So this is not an innocent uh, thing that's going on with respect to thinking about longevity. Uh, so the idea that people are going to live it, you know, till, till your um, life expectancy, that you're going to die on time, uh, you're going to die at the average age you're supposed to die. Well, nobody does that. I don't know anybody who's died exactly at their life expectancy. Uh, we can die tomorrow or we can die when we're at our maximum age of life, which for most people is 100. And, you know, by at the end of the century, oh, actually in the middle of the century, we're going to have in the U.S. around 3,000, uh, I think it's, well, it might even be a lot, much larger than uh, centenarians, people over 100. So we're going to have a good, goodly number. That's the group that's actually growing most rapidly, the people over 100 in our, in our country, and I think in, in most of Europe. So what we have to do, according to economics, is not to... Uh, uh, think about dying on time because we're only going to die once. We can't play the averages. It's not going to be at our life expectancy. We have to look at the worst case scenario, financially speaking, and that's dying at our maximum age. Uh, psychologically, the worst case is dying early. You know, we, we're very worried about dying. Uh, we, nobody really wants to die, especially if you're healthy. So, but financially speaking, dying early is a blessing because you don't have to pay for yourself. Assuming you're, you're not working, uh, the earlier you die, the better financially speaking. Uh, and if you don't take your pension benefit and you die, then you're going to be transported to heaven, to heaven and not have to worry about money. 
So you won't be kicking yourself in heaven for not having taken your government pension early. In the U.S., we have the option of waiting till 70 to take our retirement benefit. It starts 76% higher adjusted for inflation. So really everybody, almost everybody should be waiting till 70. Almost nobody does. Almost everybody uh, takes their social security benefit early and leaves their money in the market, which is of course very risky. Uh, and when you risk adjust that return, it turns out that the return on waiting for social security is dramatically higher than what than taking uh, than, than the return you can get on a safe basis from investing in the market. So the smart thing to do is do the opposite of what Wall Street is saying, which is take your, your pension benefit early and your retirement and your social security benefit late in the US. So, but in general, we need to plan for the catastrophic event, which is we live to our maximum age of life. And that's what pensions are here for. They're annuity insurance, longevity insurance. And uh, if, uh, you know, they should be inflation index protected. Uh, I imagine that's the case in, in Europe. We have lots of same local pensions in our country that are not protected against inflation. Uh, but anyway, that was my long, long answer to your short question. Thank you, Larry. I've actually heard some rumors and then I checked it up. You were running for president back in 2016, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I ran as a uh, writing candidate, and um, you can, if you register in the different states, you can be, you know, legally eligible to win. So I actually did all that, it took a fair amount of time and money, uh, but, and I also wrote a platform. The whole idea was, let's have an economist run who's not affiliated with the Reds or the Blue. I was running against Trump and Clinton, and the idea was, let me write like a hundred page platform with very simple solutions. Here's, a, you know, describe the problem in maybe five pages and a solution on one page with like 10 bullets and then move on to the next problem. Social security, taxes, education, healthcare, uh, defense, whatever, uh, all these issues of financial solvency for the country, tax reform. So I turned that uh, platform into a book called You're Hired not, not your fire, but your hired, which is sitting on my website at kotlikoff.net. It's a free download. Anybody can go there, you know, right now and, and download it for free. And it says what I would do. And I think the policies I'm proposing would be appropriate for any country, really, because it's not like one country is that much different from the other. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, just take education, for example. We have this ability to provide uniform education, independent of whether a kid kids parents are dirt poor or super wealthy they can have the same education just by having let's say half the day for an eighth grader consists of uh, zoom education or education of online instruction uh, with a headset so they're not being disrupted by other kids and everybody in the country gets the same education and the schools can decide whether or not to use it but it should be made available the best teachers of eighth grade geometry should be teaching you know, should be recorded for their entire. Anyway, that's just an example of, of the simple thing you can do to uh, equalize education in our country, which will equalize opportunity, which will equalize inheritances, which will end the massive wealth inequality. Just that simple thing. And just one little quick thing Cuba has been doing this for decades. They have a TV in every classroom throughout the country, they show eighth grade geometry, the same class to everybody throughout the country is in eighth grade. Well, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. I was thinking, was it also something in there on, you've done a lot of work on generational accounting. And for example, when you think about social welfare system in Europe and in the Western world in general, we do have sort of the debt on our books that are official one, and then the implicit debt in terms of pensions, and um, social security. If you would sort of look like at the European country, I think you looked a bit at UK. How would you, how do you, is our social uh, welfare system sustainable? Well, it's not, but it's not as a, a bad, as, you're not as, in as bad a shape as the US uh, or the UK. So what we do, uh, what economics says to do is to, take all the obligations, whether they're on the books or off the books and put everything on the books. 
In other words, and by the way, what is put on the books and what's off the books, kept off the books is a matter of language. For example, uh, the US Congress is saying that, uh, the, that the money I give for my uh, old age pension, my social security contribution, they call that a tax. And the benefit in the future, they call that a transfer payment. So that doesn't impact the, uh, uh, it doesn't lead to more debt on the books. But suppose they took the taxes that, that I'm paying this year and they called them borrowing and they give me back an IOU. And then I get to turn my IOU in for benefit, for income in the future uh, with an adjustment, a tax adjustment, if it's not exactly principal plus interest. Now we have the money I'm giving to the government being um, uh, listed as an, as part of the as an official deficit as part of the deficit, and next year then we have more debt, so then it gets put on the books just by the change in language. So what economics says is we have to have a language free, a label free description of our long term fiscal finances, and to do that, we have to generate what's called the fiscal gap, and that involves taking projections of all the outlays of a government, no matter what they're called, and including servicing official debt and all the inflows of government, the government's gonna get and take the present value difference and then ask if that's zero. Is the country solvent? Can it cover all its outlays with receipts, with inflows, with, with uh, and also, you know, uh, if we're talking about assets and official, you know, they could either be turned into a debt or just included in the calculus as stocks, you know, as current amounts it's all gets, everything gets included. Everything gets put on the balance sheet uh, of this intertemporal analysis. And what you find is that the U.S. is short, based on the Congressional Budget Office's projections, it's short 8% of GDP on an ongoing basis. That's another way of saying this is that if we want to maintain all the spending that the Congressional Budget Office says that the government uh, projects doing, that it projects the governments will, will be doing for health care, for defense spending, for uh, you know infrastructure repairs, all that. We need 8% more tax revenue every year through the end of time. Just to give you an idea, the current payroll tax for Social Security, which is 12.4% of people's pay, is uh, up to a ceiling, only covers about, is, is about 5% of GDP. So we basically need to have more than basically, uh, you know, uh, another do doubling the payroll tax would still not do it. Uh, and that would get any politician fired in 10 seconds faster than Liz Truss's uh, exchequer uh, just went the other day. So we're living in a world of ir you know irresponsibility and, and uh, fantasy because we're not looking uh, long term. The UK, the number is not 8%, it's about 7.5%. So they've got major long-term problems. According to the numbers from their Office of Budget Responsibility, OBR, I just did the calculation two nights ago. Anybody with a little bit of algebra, high school algebra, an eighth, ninth, a 10th grader could do this calculation with Excel, which is what I did, uh, could do this and uh, come up with a number. The uh, European Union does this, uh, it's called the S2 indicator, every three years, the European Council comes out with what's called the Fiscal Sustainability Report. And then buried deep in this thick documents, like this thick, you know, huge, there's something called the S2 indicator and uh, that shows you this uh, figure. And the figure for uh, Germany and France, it's around three and a half percent. Luxembourg is more like six percent. Six Slovenia is pretty high. Slovakia is pretty high. Italy, interestingly enough, Stefan, is, is at the bottom. So even though it has the, one of the highest official debt to GDP ratios, it's implicit debt, it's off the books debt is much smaller because it doesn't have, uh, it's had pension reforms. So it's gonna cut pension benefits in the future. Uh, and it's also got a healthcare system that, which may not be that good, but um, is not that expensive. And is not growing out of the out the wazoo as we say in in America. Uh, so, if you do the fiscal accounting accounting correctly, Italy looks much better than the other European Union members. Far better than the U.S. Far better than 
the UK, but because people are looking at the wrong numbers, they're getting mixed up with the labeling. Uh, Italy, Italian debt is selling at a higher you know, rate. You know, people require a higher interest rate because they're worried about the Italians defaulting. Uh, so like what you're saying, if you were like a fixed income investor, you should really look at this rather than the official numbers where they're trying to dress it up. I'm going to yeah. ask you a couple of shotgun questions. So, you know, quick questions, quick answers. Sure. So now let's turn to what you can do as an individual. And that is basically when it comes to pension, the first question is, what is risk when it comes to retirement? And the second one, what is a safe asset? Yeah, okay. Well, risk when it comes to retirement is having your living standard uh, drop down dramatically below where it currently is. So, uh, and uh, I'll get back to how you can avoid that risk in a second. Uh, and a safe asset right now might be toilet paper. <laughs> if I buy next year's toilet paper, it's going to retain value. Uh, so it's going to have a real return of zero. Whereas if I invest in, uh, in treasuries, uh, for example, U.S. treasuries, they're probably yielding uh, three, four percent right now when you're treasury. And maybe it's a little bit higher. I haven't checked the latest numbers, but if we're running at eight and a half percent, 8.2 percent inflation, the latest figure, then that's a negative real return, four or five percent. Uh, whereas the toilet paper is going to yield zero. So there's an arbitrage there. So people should be buying paper towels, toilet paper, physical commodities that are um, uh, safe against inflate, you know, cars, used cars, furniture, things you can sell in the future, homes. So this may be helping to sustain house prices, uh, even though mortgage rates are higher, clearly. And a mortgage is a really a good hedge against inflation, because even if you borrow it like 7%, which is the current rate, if inflation goes to 20%, you get to pay back in order than dollars. Plus you're borrowing potentially at a 30 year fixed rate, at least in the US we have those. So you can really make out like abandoned. And if the rate comes, if inflation comes down, you can refinance. So this helps explain why mortgage rates have gone up so much is because they're an excellent inflation hedge. Uh, now in terms of how do you, I'm giving you a long answer to a short question. You asked for a short question, answer. But let me just tell you on, on the way to hedge uh, living standard risk is, I mean, there's also inflation index bonds, at least in the US and the UK. I don't know that there are any in, in Europe, but uh, in the US at least you can buy those that are safe against inflation. They're not safe against taxation that's, con that's associated with inflation because the tax component of the return on those uh, tips and treasury inflation protected securities is itself tax, but anyway, let's set that aside for a second. Suppose you can invest safely in tips. So what you should do is take, or one thing which I call upside investing, uh, which was developed in part by Zvi Bodhi, who's a good friend of Theo's as well. Uh, he's a emeritus professor at BU. Anyway, you uh, say, I'm gonna put a certain amount in the stock market and I'm just gonna let it ride. And at some point I'll start taking it out. At some point I'll, point I'll stop taking it out, but I'm, I'm gonna ignore it because I'm going to invest everything else in tips and maintain a floor to my living standard. And we have the software maxifyplanner.com that helps people do this. You can run it in upside investing mode. And then when you take the money out of the market, if there's anything there, whenever you take out something from the casino, you invest it in tips. So now you can raise your safe living standard floor. So you have a floor to your living standard and now Starting at these, at the, as you start to withdraw, you have higher and higher potential, um, per, you know, percentile upsides. So this is called upside investing. You don't know for sure how much the upside will be. It's possible it could be zero. You could lose everything in the market. The market's volatile, but this is a way to make sure your living standard uh, never drops below the floor. That you just have upside risk to investing in the market, and the, and you can sleep at night. So that's that would make my my quick answer to how people should uh, if they can get hold of a safe asset. Now that might be, you know, buying a, an apartment that where they know there's not going to be a flood or a hurricane, or um, and that they can rent it and it's in good repair. It's a, that would be a pretty safe asset too. 
in terms of the return. Thank you, Larry. I had some ideas about buying a lot of toilet paper and figuring out how much I will need between now and the year 100, um, my 100 years birthday. And then I need to build a big storage where I can have it as well. So it might be negative return on that as well. A another question. And in the UK, many of the pension fund, the master trust, they have a sort of default strategy when you are working, which basically means you take a lot of risk when you're young and then you de-risk when you're getting older. And it's quite common they de-risk into cash for part of the money and or long nominal bonds. What would you recommend the master trust thinking about sort of the de-risking path? What should they do? Well, uh, you know, putting money in cash these days is anything but safe, right? If you had $100,000 in cash a year ago, you just lost 8.2% 8 in real terms. That's, that was a horrible investment. If you invested in long-term bonds, you probably lost 20 or 30% uh, in the market. Uh, they've done worse in stocks uh, as interest rates have gone up. Uh, if we're talking about inflation, uh, non-inflation protected bonds, even inflation protected bonds have gone down for reasons I don't fully understand, but it may be because of the tax issues associated with them. So um, you, I, think, I think you want to, uh, uh, if you're going to invest in bonds, it should be inflation index bonds if you have access to them. You know, clearly you could, for example, buy Canadian inflation index bonds or British inflation index bonds and try and also hedge the currency risk if you're living in Holland. Uh, but of course, if you're living in the UK, and I know part of your company is located over there, uh, you could buy tips uh, or, well, they're, they're equivalent uh, gilts that are inflation index and, uh, and just use that to, to develop a living standard floor. You can use our software, just put in your, uh, your inputs on an after-tax basis and turn off our fiscal system and the program is very easy to do. And then you get a, a living standard floor and then you'd see that you wouldn't have to put too much in the stock market uh, to still get a very good upside. That's the interesting thing. The stock market has such a high average return. It's not like a casino where the average return is negative. Since 1920, 19, I guess 50, actually 1929, I think the average return has been nine and a half percent real. And of course, with a huge variance, like 20% a year. Uh, around that return plus 20 percent so but that means that if you leave it in for a long you know even 15 years there's a good decent chance that you're going to get a end up with something significantly positive but of course it could also go to zero uh, so stocks are not safe in the long run uh, they the, you know it is true that the probability is going to be a higher number in the long run it's bigger but the probability that you're you have more opportunity to lose everything uh, and even and lose everything sooner than later if you, uh, you know, when you invest in stocks. So these two things offset. And so economists have long understood that stocks are not safe investments for building a, uh, but if you combine stocks with a spending strategy that doesn't spend out of the stocks, doesn't spend out of the casino until you've left the casino, now you've got the positives of the stock market while still having a living standard floor. So that's what I would say is, um, you know, what people should be thinking about doing. So Larry, I played around with your tool and I was kind of clever. I thought, like I say, put in age 50, I put in the average pension part the UK uh, saver has today of age 50. I took the average pay uh, UK person have at age 50. I put in the maximum out enrollment contributions. And look, I put also in the state pension. And then your tool basically said you have an adequacy problem. So I think the challenge, I think, for many people, if you're going to retire on, say, 100,000 or 150,000, what, what should you do? Should you, you, should you cannot use all the funky stuff you, we have in the toolbox, but... What's your recommendation? Well, we have lots of Americans who are retiring with very little in the way of assets. You know, the the typical annual spending is around sixty five thousand dollars, and if you're if you're retiring with one hundred eighty thousand dollars, we're talking about three years of spending in assets that you have, and then you'll be out of money, uh, living just on Social Security. 
So we have about 30% of American households, retirees living just on Social Security. And of course they get healthcare benefits from Medicare, but they have to pay supplemental uh, policy insurance because uh, Medicare doesn't cover all the, the costs. So this is why, you know, we have a population of very, very poor uh, old people. So one answer is people should not stop working. They should work until they drop. It, working for most Americans, I mean, uh, retiring early for most people, uh, at least in the US, is financial suicide. And that's a very strong statement. And a lot of people obviously are physically not able to work, at least their old jobs, but maybe they can work, uh, you know, doing on, online uh, customer support or phone, phone support, whatever you can do, I would say don't, don't stop working. I think the government also can play a role here uh, by, you know, we have these inflation index bonds they are called TIPS, as I mentioned. So what I've been pushing uh, publicly and privately to some people in the administration is that we should issue uh, cohort survivor TIPS. And the, the way that would work is uh, the government would sell, let's say, um, uh, 50, they would sell me a, a, a security that would be zero coupon and it would come due maybe in 20 years. Uh, so that's an example. And it, I could only collect the money, the principal plus accumulated interest if I was alive. So that's, their, that's why they're a survivor cohort. So the pricing of it would be depend on my, my cohort, when I, my age at the, in the year we're talking about when I was born in effect. And then I'd only get paid off if I'm alive and I get paid off in an inflation index manner. And then I was pushing for the, for the return not to be subject to the, only the real return to be taxable, not the inflation component. Now, if we did this, then I could buy uh, these cohort survivor tips that would, um, some would come due in 20 years, some 21 years. I could buy a whole, you know, uh, ladder of these things and in effect make an inflation index annuity for myself that to me would uh, allow the the meager savings of current Amer americans to be handed you know to produce a higher return because they would get the mortality uh, return component of an annuity and it would be inflation indexed and better protect against taxation so that's something the U u.s government could do the uk government could do uh, all the governments in, in the European Union could do. Uh, obviously, the European Central Bank could take this on. And, and to deal with the adverse election, the fact that people that know they're going to live a long time because their grandmother and great-grandmother and so forth are, are expect to live a long time, they all live till they were 150. Uh, what you would do is limit how much uh, anybody could buy in a given year, maybe uh, $25,000. Uh, max. Uh, so that's what, and I would say that should be the default, the default investment security for, for pensions. If we had this, then we could say anybody who contributes to a pension, the employer uh, uh, by law needs to put it in this safe security, the safe inflation index annuity, which would be a, com you know, a composite, a ladder of these uh, individual bonds and then uh, if you want to move the money out from there to invest in something risky, that's your business. But at least the employer, the fiduciary would not be putting you at risk from day one. You Thank know, you, Larry. Any, yeah. I have a question actually from Richard Taller to you. Uh, and instead of me just repeating what he said, let's roll the tape. Okay, Larry. And I, I think we may have discussed this at least via email, but... Uh, earlier in this show, I mentioned an idea I have, which is allowing people to essentially buy more so Social Security benefits, the equivalent of delaying claiming uh, at some actuarially fair rate with a cap on the order of magnitude of a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, there, it's very difficult to buy a reasonably priced real annuity. Um, Social Security offers one. What do you think of that idea? Yeah. I, I think Richard, uh, hope Richard gets to see this and maybe I'll call him and talk to him. 
But what Richard just proposed is almost identical to what I was suggesting. Uh, the, the difference is that uh, I want to make sure that, that the annuity, uh, the inflation component of the return on the index annuity is not subject to taxation. And uh, I also want to cap how much is purchased. And so whether you call it buying more social security benefits that are inflation indexed or buying more um, uh, or buying bonds that are inflation indexed, uh, it's really uh, just a matter of language. So we're actually enunciating exactly the same policy. And I think any good economist, Bob Merton has been put, he's uh, got the Nobel Prize in finance as does Richard. Um, and uh, he's viewed as the kind of the dean of, uh, of finance uh, in the world because, uh, you know, he's done the fun most fundamental work in, in the area of finance. Uh, he's been pushing something called selfies, which is kind of a variant on this as well. So everybody thinks we need to have annuities. They should be inflation index. They shouldn't be, uh, you know, adversely taxed when we have inflation. And this will uh, be a partly a partial salvation for all these people that are showing up in retirement, thinking that their employers have taken care of them because they participated to the max, or maybe at least partially to the max in their retirement accounts, and that Uncle Sam will take care of them because in our country because uh, they've contributed to Social Security. And it turns out that the employers have let them down, uh, that the participants haven't, not everybody participates, not everybody has a plan in which to participate. Uh, those who do participate don't contribute enough. Those who do participate and contribute enough have lost money on the market because they invested, you know, it was up to them to secure their retirement. And, uh, and then Uncle Sam, you know, is giving them this Social Security and telling, in effect, telling them on their on his website to take it early by talking about the life life expectancy right there on the website. Social Security is giving them terrible information, people. And then, uh, uh, and then once you get your benefit, they've arranged to tax it uh, at uh, beyond uh, levels bracket levels that are not indexed for inflation. So more and more people are seeing that their social security benefits are subject to federal income taxation. This is uh, while we're, we're, we're living longer. So now we're gonna have lots of starving old people in our country as a result of, you know, just terrible public policy here. We should never have started the, I, th I think the whole 401k system wa was uh, a boondoggle for Wall Street, uh, but never really, you know, why should my employer be deciding how much I can save, how much I can save on a tax free, on a tax favorite basis? Why should my employer be telling me what my taxes are? And why should my employer be telling me what I can and can't invest in? Why should he be choosing or she be, be choosing my investment options? This makes absolutely no sense. My employer might have less judgment than I do, uh, right? Yeah, it's a, but sometimes it could be good to have an employee pointing you in a direction because you would ever, never save in the first place if you're going to get the nudge. Well, we need to have, yes, we need to have a good uh, kind of reliable advisors, but to have, uh, we have 32.6 million employers in the U.S. Maybe 80% uh, of those have retirement account plans uh, are you know, are 20 million employers going to know anything about personal finance? Uh, they might be nudging us. We don't need the, the employer to nudge us. We can have other, uh, you know, the government nudging us on the radio, on the TV, on, on the internet every minute of the day saying you have to contribute. We're not going to be taking care of you when you're older uh, and make your, make automatic withdrawals. Uh, I think we need to reform our social security system in the U.S. so that we uh, close down our old system and put in a new system where everybody's contributing to a global uh, market-weighted index fund on a, um, uh, you know, where everybody gets the same return. Uh, so that's also in, the, in this book, uh, You're Hired. Bernard has a question. He says, Americans underestimate longevity. Europeans overestimated. 
I think it's this way around, what's within brackets. So the question is why and what are the consequences? Well, we have a lot of people telling us that we're going to die at our life expectancy. So Wall Street, I think, has a lot to do with this. And uh, Social Security appears to be in bed with Wall Street by uh, also emphasizing life expectancy rather than your, than your maximum age of life. I think any, any uh, financial company that mentions the, word li- the two words life expectancy, let alone the federal government mentioning it, should be you know, taken to court. Uh, so I don't know, maybe the uh, information uh, uh, that the Europeans are being given by employers and by the government, that the real concern is the catastrophic risk that you live to your maximum age of life. And it's got to be maximum, maximum, maximum age of life is the, is the mantra. Worry about the worst. Worry about totaling, you know, completely destroying your car, totaling your car. Worrying about worry about having a huge healthcare expense. Worry about your house burning down. Worry about the catastrophic, the worst case scenarios. Here, the worst case scenario is living to your maximum age. And uh, if if we broadcasted that, you know, day and night to Americans, they probably would start changing the way they're behaving. But uh, nobody nobody wants to uh, think about. Um, talk about this rationally with the public because uh, they don't want to scare them and say, look, you may not have enough money and you have to stay working. I mean, what politician wants to deliver bad news, right? When we talk about investments, we say, well, it's 95% probability, you know, well, depending on how good the models are. But uh, but when it comes to life expectancy, that's a 50% probability you're going to reach it. So. Uh, when it comes to our life expectancy, we, mm, if you're thinking about risk, we need to think a bit longer term. You're fully right with that. We have a question from Henry. It says, having a TV telling everyone the same thing is what we do. We call it the triple default, joining, contributions, and funds. Now we just need a default way to spend. Do you agree with this uh, way of creating equality? I think what Henry's saying is that we all been sort of indoctrinated in what you should do for the savings phase. We all know work, you could you join your scheme, you put money in and and, and you have your assets growing. Right. And so everybody knows what to do. And now we're sort of approaching uh, retirement. And in the UK, basically, there's no sort of guidance of what you should do. So should okay. it be in the same way you default in the when you enter into retirement as you have in the savings phase? I think the default should be uh, investing in inflation uh, protected gilts, uh, inflation index gilts that are uh, uh, give you a. So now you have, you know, the bulk of your money, the vast majority of your money, let's say 80, 90 percent is secure. And you figure out, you can use our software to figure out how much you can spend such that you can keep on spending it if you live to your maximum age of life with no probability calculations here because you can't count on dying on time. You can't say, well, there's a small probability of making it to 100, so I won't include, I'll say I'm going to die at 90 for sure, when indeed it's 100. So what economics says is that you, if since we're not likely to live to 100, what we should do is spend more when we're young, take a chance that we're not going to make it to 100, and then plan on having our living standard drop as we get closer and closer to 100. In other words, we don't truncate our planning horizon. We change our age consumption profile or age spending profile. But now how does Henry, uh, you know, beyond uh, investing in tips or, or sorry, inf- inflation index gilts, uh, get some upside? Uh, well, he can put some money in the market, even if let's say he's 60 in a global financial market, a global stock market, and just leave it there for 15 years and not even look at it. And then 15 years later, maybe I'll take it out over the following 10 years, take out a 10th every year or a 10th and a ninth and an eighth. And when he takes money out, puts it into gilts. And now he can afford to have a higher living standard for the rest of his life. Uh, so that's what upside investing is. It's ratcheting your living standard, You know, here's your floor, and then at some point it's going to be higher and then it'll be higher 
if you do better in the market, it'll be even it'll be an even higher trajectory of your of your floor. But it's higher and higher floors that you might experience the higher the more of the upside, the more the better you do on the market. That's a safe way to go through retirement. Uh, but then the government can help out by making these uh, inflation index gilts be survivor contingent, turn them into annuities, annuity bonds. And, and then people could have a decent rate of return because right now the real return on these things is nothing, right? So that's the other you know, triple whammy, quadruple whammy that people are facing. They, they save, the market has just crashed. They're just they're taking their money out probably, maybe in a panic. Uh, and now they turn around and try to invest with a decent return and tr to try and sustain themselves for the next 40 years. And there's no there there, right? Uh, so I would say to Henry, you know, do the best you can, but also don't give up working, go back to work. Basically that's this end, buy toilet paper <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then cut down, you know, try and cut down your expenses, like, you know, moving to a part of the UK where the housing's cheaper, downsize your home, uh, and, uh, or even move to a, a country that's less expensive. A lot of Americans move to Mexico, uh, and where the price, you know, the cost of living is a lot lower, housing's cheaper and taxes are lower. And they just come for back to, um, the U S for medical they, you know, trips to see their doctors. Manuel has a question, or actually has two questions, he says. So let's start with the first one. What are, in your view, some exciting innovations to deal with retirement security challenges in the last few years? I'm thinking, for instance, in terms of selfies for retirement, modern tontines and the like. Yeah, I don't know that there are selfies yet in the U.S. There may be in some other countries, but I haven't seen any in the U.S. But... Uh, whether it's not any kind of annuity product has to be fully inflation indexed to be valuable. You could have a great annuity that's not nominal and in the US and just have lost this year eight and a half percent for the eight point two percent for the rest of your life. Its purchasing power will be eight point two percent lower forever, up just due to the inflation we've incurred up till now over the last 12 months. And then if there's more inflation, which we expect, it's going to keep going down in real terms. So at the end of this inflation, you could have lost half of your value from this uh, annuity. Is whatever, the, whatever it is, it's not inflation indexed is extremely risky. So I would say, you know, the most modern, innovative, uh, exciting idea here in finance and personal finance is upside investing that I've been talking about, which is uh, putting some money in the casino, the stock market casino, not looking at it, not spending out of it, letting it ride, but then establish a floor to your living standard as best you can by continuing to work, by lowering your expenses, by moving to a foreign country if need be, uh, and, uh, and then just have upside risk to your living standard later in life. That's, I think, the best thing uh, uh, you can do. Now, if you're an American, you'd want to wait till 70 in most, you want to maximize your lifetime social security benefits. And again, you need sophisticated software that we, that we sell in our, for, the, for Americans that would do that. Uh, so in the UK and in, in Holland, whatever options there are for trying to get the most out of your pension and pay the less, least in taxes by, by timing when you take out your money and that's taxable, uh, you should, uh, you know, be focused on that too, because these are like free, you know, bundles of of euros on the ground that you they're just sitting there waiting to be picked up. There's a big freebie in the UK, which is called pension credits, which people have the possibility to get, but not everybody applies for it. Uh, those who are the target audience for it, and I think learning all the ins and outs, what you can and cannot get out of the government, should be. You know, it's a good starting point, but it's also quite tedious uh, to get there. So it's a, a lot of friction, a lot of sludge in that system that needs to be overcome. Uh, Manuel has a second question. It says, increasing the retirement age is the most effective way to ensure sustainability and 
keep pension adequacy, but it's also the most challenging reform from a political perspective. How can governments approach that reform? Uh, okay, so this is, um, uh, I think you can gradually phase in a higher retirement age, but in our system, we have 61, we're $61 trillion in the red. The unfunded liability for Social Security is enormous. It's two and a half years of GDP almost. So, you know, the official debt's about 23 trillion. Social Security's unfunded liability reported in the trustees report is 61 trillion. I don't know what the, you know, what the story is for uh, the Dutch pension system at this point or the UK pension system, but uh, I know the US uh, can't fix this problem by just raising the retirement age. We're gonna have to increase taxation, lower benefits, uh, or come, come up with some other revenue source. But this is part of a broader insolvency of the US government. Uh, as I mentioned, we're short 8% of GDP from now till the end of time. That's if we start raising the revenues by 8% today. If we wait for 20 years, then we won't be 8% number, but 20 years from now, we'll have to raise it by 12 percentage point of GDP. So our country is uh, basically bankrupt, the US. The UK is at this point bankrupt. Uh, several of the European countries, EU countries are bankrupt. And the countries that aren't bankrupt are close to bankrupt. You know, if you owe, think about uh, Germany or France, if they're 4% of GDP forever short, that's a very big tax hike. Uh, if you're getting 4% of GDP, you need to, to raise some tax rates quite dramatically. So every country should be hopped up, hopping on this. It's not that they should just do this report of the S2 indicator report, the fiscal sustainability report every th three years and say, okay, we did it. We reported it. It's hidden in the appendix. Anybody can read it and our job is done. No, the job is for the politicians to fix the problem because that number is gonna get bigger through time, especially now that interest rates are heading north. Uh, and as we start having real interest rates be positive, then, uh, and that will happen, uh, then, you know, th this problem is going to be more apparent. Thank you, Larry. We have a question also from Theo, Theo Kocken. Uh, and he says, people are quite flexible with human capital at age 60 to 75, 80, even when they think they are not. Old age poverty is often worse at really old age, especially for women. Shouldn't we really focus on security at really old age? So shouldn't we focus more on annuities for the tail end of our life, deferred annuities, for example? Yeah, we should have, um, the US has deferred annuities. They're, um, uh, they're uh, nominal and, uh, and uh, that means uh, what you're gonna exactly get out of these deferred annuities. You could put some money down today and the annuity might start in 15 years, uh, but the real level uh, at which it starts is completely dependent on the ensuing inflation between now and 15 years from now. So we do need to have deferred annuities, as Theo is saying. Hi, Theo. I uh, hope, <laughs> uh, hope we see each other soon. Uh, but these annuity, all these, all these products need to be inflation protected. And the government can help by, uh, you know, providing these cohort survivor index bonds because then all kinds of financial products can be made off of that, off of those securities, can be hedged against those securities. So that would be my very strong recommendation to any, uh, to the European Central Bank, to the U.S. Uh, Treasury. Uh, well, I don't know what the UCB, maybe, the, maybe this is an issue for, uh, for the treasuries of the different uh, governments, uh, since they are issuing the bonds, I guess it's not really. Well, I don't know. You know, uh, it, I guess it is the treasuries have to. In the first instance, the finance ministries have to issue these bonds. Well, why not do it? Why not so have? You, you're basically saying that you don't expect the market to solve this, but you're looking at a sort of government version or government solution to it, which might not be a sort of pay-as-you-go thing, but it could also be a finance solution, for example, through... It's a, it's a finance solution. 
because you know the government is the only one in a position to ensure inflation because at some level the government's respond you know the government prints money to pay its bills it's causing inflation how can the private sector hedge against that it's really in the hands of the government so the government by issuing inflation index securities is uh, letting people buy protection against the government okay which is what yeah. we need we need to have protection against the government going but uh, bananas and having uh, nut bags running our governments. We have, you know, we've seen uh, irresponsible politicians in the UK, the US, and it's not just Trump, uh, but, you know, running, running up the official debt from 30% of GDP back in 2008 to 100% today, uh, Yes, we've had problems. Yes, we had a great recession. Yes, we had COVID. But leaving all these bills for our kids, plus all the unofficial liabilities getting bigger, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is what you would expect people to do if they hated their children and grandchildren. And nobody's talking about it publicly, except, you know, we're having this conversation. I know Card Cardano is very concerned about this and has been, Theo has been a leader of this uh, concern in Holland, uh, but uh, but the other thing to say uh, in response to Theo's question is that people that can be active in their 65 to 80 should stay active and keep working. And so what the government can do is really push on employers to hire the elderly because we have so much age discrimination, it's all implicit. I see this right in my you know economics department. I, uh, we hired, uh, a 60 year old a couple of years ago at my insistence, I had actually bang on the, on the table in front of the president of the university to say, hire this economist. And it was like, well, he's 60, he's over the hill. Uh, he didn't exactly say that. And then a couple of years later, you know, I've insisted, he hires the guy with, with the chairman, we both got him to do this, hires the guy who's a leading economist. And a couple of years later, the president, I see him at a cocktail party, he says, how's your moose head? He thought we hired this guy as a figurehead. I said, well, have you looked at his CV, uh, his, his, you know, his, his resume? He said, no, what's in there? He said, well, he's the most productive economist in the department in terms of publications in top five journals. And then a year later, he says, well, you know, that guy we were paying all this money to, who's your moose head, I don't see him in the newspaper. I said, well, he's a theorist. Theorists don't appear, they're not writing articles for the newspaper. They're doing top level research. Uh, look at his Vita. You know, this was a huge success. This is why the department's ranked so high in large part. It was very hard to get across. And he himself is not a young guy, the president. Yeah. Uh, so he, you know, he was a chemist and he had a preju prejudice that anybody who's in, in academia does all their best work before 35. After that, they burn out and best to get rid of them uh, or not to hire them. Yeah. Uh, Larry, I have a, we have asked you a lot of questions now, and now you can ask a question to the next guest of Pioneering Pensions, and that's Bonnie Jean MacDonald from the National Institute of Aging in Canada at Ryerson University. And she's been going to think, she's thinking a lot about what happened in old age, how are people consuming, what are the, what are, how are they doing? So, I mean, what, what question would you like to ask her? Well, I, I'd like to ask her whether uh, the uh, Canadian government is, uh, or whether she can, she and others in, in her area can encourage the Canadian government to issue survivor contingent zero coupon uh, uh, inflate, uh, bonds, inflation index bonds that would be protected uh, uh, against taxation on the inflation component of the return. Because if she can get that to happen in Canada, then we can, the US will see this as a model and the UK will see this and European governments will see this. And then this will just spread across the world. So we don't have to have a big country uh, enact this. We can have a, a small country that, um, is responsible and that people respect in terms of what it's doing financially and trying to help the elderly. And that could just, 
really uh, matter materially for everybody in the, uh, you know, in, in the countries we're talking about. Same thing with Japan, you know, South Korea, all these countries have uh, the same kinds of issues, China, Russia, it's not uh, unique to the US or to UK. We're all sitting in the same boat when it comes to aging populations. Uh, Larry, I would say it was a pleasure to have you here. Our time is running out. I think I could have continued for another 10, 15 minutes to, during this discussion. And also would like to thank everybody in the audience for coming here. And I'm looking forward to see you all on the 10th of November uh, with Bonnie Jean McDonald's. And once again, Larry, it was a pleasure to have you here and nice to see you.